Okay, we're here in the Roquerille with Oliver. So you, you have just played here at the Roquerille. How would you uh, present yourself to people who don't know you? You know, I mean, just, just musician. I would yeah. say singer-songwriter. I mean, I do all sorts of different things, you know. I have cheesy love songs and... Well, music-wise, I mean, I think, you know, before I made my own music as a teenager, uh, growing up in New York, like early rap became a big thing and I was like 13 so I think when you're 13 you start getting into music and like so I had friends and we had drum machines and then just because I was into drum machines and all that it was just natural to also pay attention a little bit to synths and my father was a uh, college professor they closed the music department and he just dumped all this music here in the basement and then I hit puberty and I fell in love with this girl and I, she immediately like tore my heart out and I was in a friend's car and uh his sister, this younger, his little sister had a Depeche Mode Black Celebration and she starts playing it and as we're driving there, like, oh, When shit. was that? It must have been right when it came out. It must have been like 1986, uh, right when Black Celebration 86. first came out. Yeah. And by the end of the drive, I was like, that was it. I was just totally different from that moment on. I mean, it I was just- It changed your life. Yeah. And then just about, I would say- What six, was her name? Sandra, she was the one that uh, I later ended up uh, winning a contest, and I met Depeche Mode, and she yeah, was in the movie with me. So, so that was the, that was my first girlfriend. Um, but so, it was so all happening at the same for, time. Just for for the people who are listening, you ended up I in became the movie so of uh, Depeche Mode called 101. Right. I became so obsessed with Depeche Mode, like I would do anything to meet them. And then there was a contest. I yeah. went out there. For some reason, I won. And the, the reason I won actually is because I looked really weird. But you had also, a different look. Yeah, like this big mock. <laughs> But also the screen test, they like they record you and they're like, well, why why should you be in this movie? And my answer was, because Depeche Mode is the greatest band of all time. <laughs> That's what I said. I still think so, but it was just you know, it worked. It worked. <laughs> um, but so to get back to the Belgium connection, so I would say six months in, by the time uh, I just became obsessed with every Depeche Mode thing that was out, and. This girl, the Sandra, she had a psychiatrist, and her psychiatrist gave her a cassette. This is true, and the cassette was from Two Four Two no official way. version, and it was like which to one, me which one? official version. Oh yeah. So for me, it was like Depeche Mode, but really fucked up and crazy. And like at that age, I was just totally taken. I was like, I became so obsessed with Front Number Two. I, I, and I tried everything to make the music, and I would listen, and I couldn't figure it out. And I had all these like crappy keyboards and it never could come close because now when you listen nobody even comes close now I mean there there was a lot of hard work that went into that yeah and a lot of people working on it adults not you know some kid yeah um, and that just led me to later you know doing a cover for number two and you know becoming obsessed with EBM and all that and then I got sidetracked because just like how rap took over New York extremely techno did you know they, they had the big mm -hmm. parties in in um, in the UK, this one DJ, Frankie Bones, comes back to New York and starts throwing raves really early on, like 90. The cool thing about that scene was, unlike Front Number 2 and all these things where I was like trying to make the music and I couldn't make it, all I needed was a 303 and a drum machine and I could play at these events and be better than anyone else that was playing at the time. So I just became, and just by luck, because I was only one of maybe 20 people making techno that year, it really launched my career just because, just because. It was like this new thing, Happy New York, right place, right time. And then that was it for a long time until I would say like 96. And it took, I guess, six years went by. And then I was like, you know what? Vocals are missing. Yeah. I'm better than I used to be. And also, uh, computers could now record yeah. audio along with the music. Mm -hmm. So I could actually start to do this. And I started to, and that's when I started my own label, Things to Come. Mm -hmm. And on the second record, I did a song called We're in New York City, which was a joke. I never thought anything of it. And that also, so. So the, you did it like a joke? Well, you know what happened? Okay, so I never drank or did any drugs until I was 25. So 1995, I was 25, and this all makes sense in the timeline. Um, I was uh, New Year's Eve, and I had all my friends from high school there uh, that I hadn't seen for a while because I was already in college, and they all decided they were going to take ecstasy. So I was like, I'm not fucking. <laughs> I was like, there's no fucking way I'm taking drugs. Like, my parents did drugs. I had a very negative view of drugs <laughs> or drinking. Uh -huh. So they took them like till two in the morning to convince me to take it. So I take it, and then like, all right, we're going to walk uptown. And as I'm walking, everyone starts walking. I'm like, falling behind. And I'm like, and I start to feel it, and I was like, oh shit. So that led me to about six months of only doing drugs. Like, that's all I did. I overdosed, but what happened that was... That gave you the idea. Well, it was like, I thought that I could never do it again. So I wanted to write songs about it while it was still fresh. So yeah. I wrote 
you know, a couple songs about it. But it was really just like, I don't know, I just did it. It was really just like a DAT machine, a 909, and two keyboards. And I was just muting things on the keyboard and telling the story on a mic. There was no real thought about it. Um, and actually, for about a year, that song just sat. And I tried to give it to Lenny D from Industrial Strength. All these techno labels, everyone's like, what? no way. Which like, label? Uh, Industrial Strength Records. It's a label, techno label from Brooklyn. But nobody wanted it. And then I was like, I always thought that it was cool when records had like lots of different stuff on it. So I just put them on. And, you know, just pure luck. I mean, you know. And it worked. It, it works, yeah. And it, uh, like, you know, life is like that. I think most of the time, you just, if you're doing a lot of stuff, you're going to get lucky sometimes. But you have to do a lot. And then, you know. And then what happened? Uh, you had your, your first LP? I did my first album, which was really just like all like a collection of like all the songs I did up until 2001 that were good. And then around 2001, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go see a psychiatrist. And this is what's funny about it. So I'm seeing this, this woman and she was cool. And she's like, well, let me hear your music. And I was like, yeah. But she, the only thing she helped me with was she did an amazing thing. She said, when she heard all my early music, which was all like, I'm gonna kill you and I hate this, or this person hates this person. She yeah. says, Oliver, this is all about yourself. You are singing about yourself. You hate yourself and you're singing about it. And then as soon as she said that, I was like, you're right. And then I wrote Joyless Pleasure and my new stuff, which is so much better because I'm just being honest, you know? Yeah, you and it is yourself. much better. People can relate to it. Yeah. And then things really change, you know? Like, uh -huh. you know, different, a different crowd of people are becoming more interested in my music. People that listen to music like I do, not just like, you know, when you play the techno party, all you need is a beat, and everyone's like, ah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's different, you know. Yeah. I'm not an naysayer. I love that stuff. Like, I mean, if I'm working out or having sex or any of these things, there is a time and a place for that music if you're, if certain drugs. But, I mean, it's not like I'm going to sit and, like, with my headphones on, like, when I've got Strange Love 12 inch and listen, like, 100 times over again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Depeche Mode was uh, very important for you. Mm hmm. No, I mean, not only did I become obsessed, when I went on tour with them, I saw, like, the most amazing success you can imagine. Like, of course I'm going to be like, well, this is what I want to do. Like, how could you not at 17 years old? Mm -hmm. And there were times, like, they were so nice to us. Like, people don't even know. Like, um, I think that there were times when I was arguing with my girlfriend and, like, they would talk to me. Or, like, Martin would sing on the bus to us. Like, just, it was yeah. just crazy. Like, yeah. and they would be nice afterwards. A few times I saw them, like... Do you still see them now? Sometimes, but not, like, I don't call them or, like, there was a, maybe two or three years they would do things and they would invite us, yeah. um, but now it's just like, if so, if I see them, they'll be nice. So, I was at Limelight once and Jeff Mills was a famous DJ, I don't know, he was actually hanging out with Martin Gore and I was there and I was like, Jeff, who's that? He's like, that's Martin. I was like, hey, Martin. He's like, hey, Oliver. And he was like, remembering me and I was like... And then he asked me for drugs, which was so weird. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> he recognized you. He did recognize me. They all did. And, and then Fletch had a label. Yeah. And then he had this band on called Client. Client, and they played, yeah. yeah. They played Client. in New York. And they wanted me to do a remix. So I came. And I was like, hey, Fletch. And he's like, I know your record. And that was like, you know, that's unbelievable, you know. I mean, it's Fletch. It's not Martin, but it's still cool. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, they will never read this, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, so, we hope they will. Yeah, of course. <laughs> So let's talk about your stuff. So you preparing a new album? I am a pre preparing a new album. And this album is super focused. And this is actually going to be the hardest album I ever wrote because what I want to do... What kind of, what kind of direction? Okay, so on? what I want to do is an EBM album. A proper EBM album. So all my music up until now has been like a mix of... Like, you know, oh. like well, not only that, the, the, the equipment that I used, like, so, like a lot of software or stuff like that. But now I have this... You want to go analog. Well, now I have all this analog stuff. I have this modular. Yeah. And one of the things that I realized is I always tried to do EBM tracks, but the problem was the patterns, like they're just the bass lines, they never, they never really sounded right. And mm -hmm. I could never figure it out. So I got the modular and an analog sequencer, and there it was. It was like just... And then I also, because I got a really good job now, eBay came calling. So now I have every drum machine you can imagine. Like, I have the best studio. So I can make this album now. Now if I could get uh, Jean-Luc Demeyer in my studio, I could make Frontier for two record. I could definitely do it. Let's do it! I want to do it. I'm very tempted. And... I know. I can, I, he's a friend of mine. Yeah, I mean, I have these slow connections, like how job I'm friends, and he's like, oh yeah, we just... And I'm like... I want to be prepared, like it's got to be right, but I could do this because everyone records him now, but no one's really working on his vocals like that, or no one's pushing him to do a song. Like, you know, they're just letting him do whatever, which is good, but it's not like it was, you know, like I don't really want to, like, but you got, if you're going to do that to some guy that's 
a legend and old, you have to pay him. And I, you know, I'm one who's ready to do it. You have to, even if he doesn't want it, you have to do it. You know, because you, you know, you gotta get what you want. I want to be able to say to him, "Not good enough. Try again." Like, come on. You know, like I want him to really do it. And you can't get that from someone unless you really, if he's working for it. You know, on the on the way, I'll do the CBM album. But the hardest part is the vocals. It's going to be the most difficult because real, not really good. You, not for you. You know, to do EBM vocals, really good ones. If you listen to like Nitzrab that you total mean singing, then well, more like like Nitzrab that total age. Yeah, like to do vocals like that, you don't. They're yeah, brilliant. They're they're just it. they're so like simple and dumbed down, but brilliant. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it has to be right, and I, that's why I don't like most of what I hear now. It's the vocals that ruin it for me. Yeah, and it's gonna it's be tough. Difference. You know, I started the album. I've got one track that's just awesome. I don't even play it live because I really want this to be a big surprise. There. So when when can we expect something? Well. I'm, no <laughs> I'm always late. I'm no always deadlines. Late. Well, I mean, when it's done, right? That's what you're yeah. supposed to say. But I would like to. I'd like to start releasing like two or three singles from it uh, after the summer, and then have it out maybe by my birthday in January. Okay, that's that's the goal. And then you have your project Schadenfreude. Ah, yes, you yeah, like that. I yeah. know that. Yeah. <laughs> and that. Oh, so that was like an early test. So those songs are 100% the modular. Yeah. And they just sound so good. And the girl that does the vocals is like just brilliant. Andy. Yeah, and really brilliant. Uh -huh. I like I like the the, the the things that you posted on SoundCloud. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah, I really like those. And it's like I told her she's very new, but she okay. So she's is she, she from New York? She's well, she's from Virginia. She's 20, 26, and she wrote a book on. Uh, post-punk photos and that's how I met her she asked me for some photos and then we met but the funny thing is she knows every she knows every single record that I know like she's obsessed with this time period which I don't understand how you cannot like it's before your time it would be like me being obsessed with something that happened in the 60s or the 70s like yeah but she's obsessed like yeah. really that's how she is I mean everything about her clothes everything I guess me <laughs> I'm like a relic to her I'm like I'm like a time capsule <laughs> you're, but, you're growing old <laughs>